we could be tempted to think that Jesus is an arsonist. That he wants to set the earth on fire. But we know that the fire that he wants to send us is that of the Holy Spirit. He wants us to be blazing hot. Because if we know anything about God, heaven is hotter than hell. You have in the throne room of God, the angels that are the highest of the choir are called the seraphim. They, that means in Hebrew, the burning ones. They're burning with the love of God. And it's interesting, there's some who speculate. I'm not saying everybody has to believe this, but there are some who speculate that the flames of purgatory are actually the love of God. It's just that instead of it being a, a love of communion, it's a love of purification. And there's also some that speculate that hell is that people aren't in communion with God and can't be in communion with God, and yet God still loves them because he can't deny himself. And so it is, it's experienced as a lake of fire. But we see his desire is that we be blazing. His desire is that we be divided from sin and from worldly mentalities that would lead us to sin and even divided from people who would either lead us to sin or continue to encourage sin. And that's how come he has these strong words about, hey, I've come to divide families up. It's like, wait a minute, Jesus, I thought you were the prince of peace. He's like, yeah, but it's a holy warfare for peace. It's a holy warfare. It's a warfare of love. We can think of the many examples of saints who have had to go against their family. St. Thomas Aquinas, if you know anything about him, was inspired at first to become a Dominican, but his family had political aspirations for him, and they wanted him to become a Benedictine, to take up residency in a a particular abbey, and therefore be influential. Well, he decided, no, I want to become a Dominican. So they locked him in a tower, and they tried to introduce a prostitute, too, some, some Benedictine they wanted him to be, right? <laughs> they didn't care about, actually, the kingdom. They cared about power. And, of course, we, we know the story is that he prayed, and he was able to, he was, he was given the virtue of chastity by an angel in order not to sin with the woman. And then he escaped and ran off and became a Dominican. Interesting story, though, that an angel could give St. Dominic the virtue of chastity, right? We can sometimes be very caught up on how the devil can tempt us to sin, and he tries to get us to sin, and he tries to wound, and his minions do the same thing. What we've got to remember is that that the angels outnumber the devils two to one. And if the demons tempt us to sin, the angels are encouraging us to holiness, Likewise, the angels can also help us in that regard. Yet, we have something even greater than the help of angels. We have the help of Almighty God. So we hear in this first reading this great encouragement. This is like, this, this basically kind of ex, ex, like blows away every excuse that we think stops us from being saints. This scripture passage. Now to him who is able to accomplish far more than we ask or imagine. By the power at work within us. Hmm. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Because specifically Paul is praying for this deep encounter. He says, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that he may grant you in accord with the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner self. The Holy Spirit. We have Halloween coming up pretty soon. Some people have forgotten that that's the eve of All Hallows or the the Halloween, All Halloween. That it's a reminder that we're all called to, to sanctity. 
And I like the fact that in some Christian households, you'll see a little sign outside their door that says, Ain't no ghost here but the Holy Ghost. (laughs) And if that's the case in terms of their house, their physical house, how much more so should that be true for us in terms of the house that is our body? That we should be able to say here, ain't no ghost here but the Holy Ghost. With great confidence, of course, in the Lord that he's merciful. If we fall into sin, he'll forgive. He will, so long as we're willing to say, hey, it was me, I did it. Right? Right? Because the ones who try to hide their sins, what happens? Well, that's pride. And that's also... Um, that's, that's what gets us in trouble. Is trying to say, oh, no, 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 I, don't, I, I can justify myself away. Or, that wasn't sin. So we ask the Lord today that we may basically experience St. Paul's prayer within us. That we may be strengthened with power through the Holy Spirit in our inner selves. So that the dwelling of Christ might be made more perfect in us. He's in us by grace, right? That we receive through faith. And we ask that we may be ever more rooted and grounded in love. We ask that we might be strengthened to comprehend, that is, to receive the height and the depth and the breadth and the length and, and the width of the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge. <laughs> and this is great. So that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. I mean, can, can you imagine that? Can you imagine being filled with the fullness of God? And yet at every single Mass, who do we receive? God. So is St. Paul only talking about receiving Jesus in communion? No. There's something to be said about the fact that we receive such great gifts, right? But somehow, for some reason, even though we receive such great gifts, there's still a part on our part to have to believe in what we have received. To have to understand, this is beyond measure. The gift that we receive in Jesus Christ is beyond measure. And when we begin to challenge our limited thinking and begin to ask the Lord to transform our thoughts according to his way of thinking, that's when miracles happen. When we stop thinking, oh, this is impossible, this situation is impossible, this thing is impossible, this is not going to... When we stop thinking that and we say, no, no, to him who is able to accomplish far more than we ask or imagine, he's able to do it. Like the woman who had the hemorrhage for 12 years in, in, in the gospel, right? Jesus was walking in a crowd and people were bumping into Jesus, but none of them were being healed. Why not? They had no expectation. They may have believed that Jesus could heal people, but they had no expectation that Jesus would heal them right then and there just by bumping into him. No expectation. And yet a woman who's got a hemorrhage for 12 years, has seen that Jesus can heal people by touching them. She knows, wait a minute, I've got a flow of blood, so if I touch him, because of the Jewish law, I might end up, quote-unquote, defiling him. We know that that's not the case with Jesus, right? right? In the Old Testament, if a leper touched somebody, what happens? The, the person becomes unclean. When Jesus touches a leper in the New Testament, the leper becomes clean, right? That's the power In the Old Testament, the power of sin versus the power of God in the New Testament. Okay? So this woman who's got this issue of blood, she reasons to herself, power is in this man to heal. I don't want to touch him, but if I touch the hem of his garment, I shall be healed. She goes up and she touches the hem of his garment. And power flows out of Jesus and he knows it. And he turns around and he says, who touched me? And the apostles are like... (laughs) Jesus, it's like you're on a bus in Italy. Everybody's touching you right now. (laughs) 
<laughs> or like in Tokyo, you know, they actually have to push people into the subway. They actually have professional pushers, you know. Who's touching you? Everybody right now, Jesus. And he turns around and, and the woman explains and he says, woman, your faith has saved you. It has healed you. The word salvation, Jesus as our savior. The word salvation means not just to be forgiven of sin. It also means to be delivered from evil spirits because we hear Jesus will say, hey, you've been saved, right? It also means to be healed, like in this case. So when we literally say, when we listen to St. Paul in Ephesians say that he is able to accomplish far more than we ask or imagine, we want to begin to believe that this means every single wounded thing in me that's stopping me from becoming a saint or stopping me from loving people or stopping me from being patient or stopping me from having X, Y, Z in terms of virtue, it can, be, it can bow now in the name of Jesus. That is, that it can be removed by the one who's able to heal us. The one who's able to do far more than we ask or imagine. Because let's face it, we can't do it. Jesus has said that to us. In terms of our entering in the, into the kingdom, he said it. For man it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. So the minute that we realize Jesus is not asking for us to set ourselves on fire with the Holy Spirit, the minute that we realize that God is not asking for us to sanctify ourselves, the minute that we realize that instead he's asking for us a faith-filled surrender to one who is mysterious that we can't comprehend, but who we know and we can trust as being good that we can't tame him, that's when our faith really kicks off. And that's when God can really begin to change the world, even through our simple prayers. So we ask the Lord for that kind of faith, that kind of renewal today. That we may be filled with his goodness today. Not just the earth. But that we may be filled with his goodness today. And that that goodness may bring us all peace and all good.